territorial. Your address for sport. Yeah, girls have been working really well, so there's a long way to go. But yeah, we're progressing each day, getting better, and that's all you can do, just get better each day. So I'm really proud of the girls and the effort they're putting in. They've got an open mind to come to training and learn new things and approach cricket differently, which I, I'm very proud of them, and it's been great working with them. Your address for culture. Life is about balance. We have to also have the positive with the negative. And where the positive exists, we have to take time to celebrate. So even as we have so many of our young people being impacted negatively by this culture of violence, in the next few days, we are going to see hundreds of them playing their drum, dancing, learning to walk on stilts, playing the pan. Your address for news. Joe Biden's legacy of a accomplishment over the past three years is unmatched in modern history. In one term, he has already, yes, you may clap. <laughs> In one term, he has already surpassed the legacy of most presidents who have served two terms in office. Talk City, 91.1 FM, your address for talk. All right, my friends, you are listening to Talk City 91.1 FM, your address for talk. And let us try to connect with the Indaba committee once again. Good night, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, good evening, Nelly. Good evening, good evening to our listeners and, and uh, our viewers live. We are on live. Good evening, good morning, wherever you are. This is Indaba, the program of the Emancipation Support Committee of Trinidad and Tobago. We are live on Talk City 91.1 FM and also on Facebook and YouTube. As uh -huh. usual, we have a lively program on for you tonight, but we have to welcome especially our new permanent co-host, René Francois. Welcome, René. As well, uh -huh. René has always been on the show here. She is our technical expert behind the scenes, of course. Without her, we would have no show, but she has moved from background to the front of the program. Now she's now a face on the program and we welcome her uh, uh, from this evening. She'll be a regular feature on in Dabo. This evening yes, we uh, are going to have the Africa report as usual. We are looking at South Africa, a situation that we touched on last week in our roundup of events on the continent. We are going to have a review of what's going on in Venezuela by our special elections overseer, none other than co-host Mr. Shabaka Kambon. And then we are going to have a feature discussion on decolonization in the Caribbean. And we are looking at the case of the Dutch ruled territories. I hesitate to call them colonies, as you would see on your flyer, because the constitutional statuses could be very baffling, at least to me. But we do have a special guest from one of these uh, territories on. We will introduce her uh, later, or is she coming on now? We will introduce her uh, later. So we are going to save that uh, introduction when she comes on. Good evening once again, welcome to the program, and we are going to take on the Africa report. Rene, could you bring up the report, please? I stand before you to accept the decision of the deputy president of the EFF. That's Julius Malema, president of South Africa's Economic Freedom Fighters Party. Welcome back to the Africa Report, in which we will do a roundup of some of the major news and developments since our last edition on the 26th of June. But first, I want to pay tribute to the great nation of Haiti, the first country in the
Obama versus Floyd Chivambu is not the political battle we were expecting in 2024. Mkondo Sizwe is the final answer of the problems of our country. As promised in our last edition, this week's focus of the Africa Report is on the Economic Freedom Fighters Party, the EFF, putting into perspective the shock resignation of its deputy president, Floyd Shivambu, as a member of the party and a member of parliament. My sincere plea is that in its reflection of the decision that I have taken, the organization should also avoid mischaracterization of an otherwise revolutionary and disciplined decision to not renew membership of the EFF. Malema and Shivambu, president and deputy president, often acclaimed publicly that they were brothers, not just comrades. Even at the press conference on Thursday, 15th August, to publicize the resignation, Malema still avowed that Shivambu remained his political sibling and that the door remained open for Shivambu's return to the EFF. When he sent me a letter yesterday, I felt the same pain when I received the news of the passing away of my mother. Because Floyd, to me, is not just a comrade. Is a brother, and he will remain a brother even when he pursues his political career differently. Some events are better understood by going back to the beginning. So let's take a quick look at the foundation of the EFF. Malema began doing political work for the ANC at the age of six years. At 14, he became an official member of the ANC's Youth League rising through the ranks to become its president from 2008 to 2012, serving mostly under President Jacob Zuma. Before long, Malema transformed from being the principal propagandist for ANC officials to a bitter critic of the party's leadership, especially President Zuma. In 2011, Malema began to campaign vigorously for the ANC to remove Zuma from the position of president of the ANC, which according to ANC practice meant that he could no longer serve as the country's president. Zuma's supporters, however, turned the tables on Malema, charged him before the party's discipline committee, and expelled him in April 2012. The turning point for Malema and Shivambu was the massacre by police of 34 black miners at Marikana in August 2012. Shivambu responded to the plight of the miners who had no recourse to institutional justice. Then on the 17th of uh, August, the immediately the next day, the morning, the next morning, I went to Marikana with a Magata and a pit. Soon after, the workers invited Malema to meet with them. Uh, Marigana happens, I'm in Bulugwan. The workers say, where is that guy? We need that guy to come and listen to us. Both Shivambu and Malema blamed Zuma for the crime against the miners and reiterated a call for him to step down. This was the political context and the atmosphere in which the EFF was born and which cemented the brotherly bond between Malema and Shivambu. From their first elections in 2014, EFF's political star was always rising. By 2023, after 10 years of existence, the EFF was at its strongest, occupying 44 seats in the National Assembly and many seats at provincial level. The next step was to defeat the ANC, but out of the political opposition shadows, Zuma re-emerged in December 2023 to become the fly in Malema's ointment once again. It was Zuma's MK that became the biggest threat to the ANC, displacing the EFF as the third force in South African electoral politics. The dog-eat-dog -dog negotiations that followed the electoral debacle of the ANC and the decline of seats in the EFF exposed the weakness in Maluma's stranglehold on the party. Shivambu's defection to MK, however, shook the very foundation of the EFF edifice, and Malema did not immediately know how to repair the damage. The scene of the press conference to announce Shivambu's resignation was political theater. 
Shivambu had submitted his resignation letter to Malema the day before, so there was no logical reason for both leaders to be on the same stage. The scriptwriter did a great job. They put on a good show, but the optics exposed their discomfort. It was evident from Malema's facial expression and the Shivambu's constant sipping of water that all was not well. Political analysts found great difficulty in explaining Malema's extraordinary calm and uncharacteristic statesmanship. They did not have long to wait to see the vin. versus Floyd Chivambu is not the political battle we were expecting in 2024. Mkondo is the GTU and all those who served in the GTU under the deputy president are dissolved. You want to deploy anyone into the government on behalf of the EFF, you shall report to the office of the president. We are taking charge of our organization now. We are tired of entrusting in the hands of wrong people. We have been betrayed for too long. We have been sold out for too long. We have been trusting for too long. We need to take it into our hands and run it ourselves. Shivambu's trading of his Sankara Red Beret for MK's camouflage cap was Zuma's revenge against Malemo, and he immediately set about to restructure MK, setting it on a trajectory to ultimately take back the presidency. He did not only welcome Shivambu, but gave him the most important portfolio, that of national organizer responsible for driving the party's programs, including drafting party policies and building nationwide structures. At the press conference called to announce the new MK, Shivambu was compelled to respond to Malemo. It's a genuine political discussion, which all South Africans must enter into, those who are in favor of the revolution. Because revolution is the content of what we're standing for. It's not just, no, if it's me, you are betraying me. You know, some people will say, you are betraying me. Where does that enter? I'm, and you don't even once suggest that I'm betraying the revolution. I will never betray the revolution. <laughs> because we're not, we're not in the business of trying to please each other's egos here. Yeah. We're in the business of building a revolutionary movement that is going to emancipate the black majority and Africans in particular, and we're unapologetic about that. Yeah. That is what we stand for. Interestingly, both Malema and Shivambu declare that their true loyalty is to the revolution alone, the revolution that was declared when MK was launched in 1961. Both also declare their commitment to uniting the progressive forces under a single black caucus. Trita is going to tell us to abandon the progressive caucus. But let me tell you, we are not in alliance with MK. We have nothing to do with MK. What MK does is none of our business. 
we disagree with MK. We are going to contest MK. We are going to say what we want to say and how we feel about MK. But when we arrive in Parliament, the progressive must unite against the GNU of the racist DA and the Freedom Front Plus. Perhaps what South Africa is witnessing is not the collapse of black power, but the Big Bang that would create a new ethos of unity for the liberation of South Africa from the stranglehold of white capitalism and internal neocolonialism. Yes, so that's the Africa report. We had a little technical uh, glitch at the somewhere around the middle but i i think uh, rene overcame that problem so thank you rene um to me what is happening in south africa right now puts south africa at its most important juncture since the end of apartheid in 1994. what we are witnessing is the imperative for the emancipation of Africa, as uh, Shivamu expressed it. And uh, the others like uh, Malema talk about the liberation of Africa as well, the bringing together of the progressive forces. But what we are really talking about is decolonization, you know, and I, I'm saying so in the context of the discussion we are going to have later. This is about decolonization in South Africa, apartheid was a system of internal colonization, meaning the colonization by a settler uh, group of imperialists. That is the people that were called Boers and who call themselves Africaners now. It's a system of internal colonization. They appropriated 87% of the land, very little of that has been handed back. They are still in control of the economy. They are still in control of all the productive forces, the land, the majority of the productive land and so on. So what we do have is internal colonization. And uh, the struggle is about decolonization or emancipation or liberation, however you put it. But it will determine whatever happens, whatever the outcome from the struggles which really might be trying to find a way around the problem of the elections, because essentially it, it came out of the elections where the ANC technically lost the elections, but bounced back to command almost all of the important posts together with the former appetite dominated party called the DA today right but the vast majority of the people who control the da were also the, the controllers of the appetite system and they do control the economy the land and so on so that is the situation there i don't know if um uh Rene, you would like to make a comment on the africa report and um, is, shabaka, is shabaka joining us at all um i believe shabaka is ready to join us <laughs> yes, I, I have to apologize. I'm joining you tonight from the car on the road. We have just left the National Consultation on Monuments. Great, great, great. So perhaps you can tell us a little bit about that as well. Yes. Yeah, so, well, Renee, would you like to comment a little bit before we bring Shabaka on? Yeah, um, I, just one statement. I think it, it was a little bit... Um, disappointing that Julius Malima didn't, um, I can't say that I did expect him and his party to to win outright, but just disappointing that um, that wasn't the case, really, yeah. Well, I don't think he expected to win actually, but he expected to do a lot better. But, uh, yes. He would have done better, he would have done better <laughs> if not for M. Kunto. He would have done much, much better than he, he actually did in the election. But now, the challenge now is how do they collaborate in order to ensure that the, 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 the progressive forces are not further weakened and undermined. So that is the big challenge for them now. And uh, they are the ones who can do something about it, nobody else. 
So Shabaka, um, could you tell us, would you want to start up with Venezuela as advertised or tell us a little bit about some of the highlights of the, of the, of the, of the meeting today? Yeah, I think I just have to say something about the consultation, uh, you know, as it as it began. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, I think everybody would be relieved to know that I think the majority of respondents in the session today were in support of change. Unfortunately, uh, the colonial epistemic violence represented by monuments to Christopher Columbus and Picton and the coat of arms was on full display. And so uh, a gentleman describing himself as Portuguese uh, from Belmont literally told the chairman of the Emancipation Support Committee to go back to Africa as she was making her comments. He felt entitled to be very racist and rude to her. Uh, and of course, when he took the mic, I'm, I'm surprised that, you know, many people were surprised that he wasn't entirely kicked out. When he took uh, the, the microphone, he went one step further to sort of restate all the, um, all the ideas, all, the, all the, 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 the stereotypes about indigenous people that come with the Columbus hero myth. And of course, he was defending Christopher Columbus. So it was very interesting to see him defending the monument and uh, and restating all the uh, various racist stereotypes about the indigenous people that are present in the in the myth. So he told Chief Barat, for example, that his people were savages and that they were constantly fighting each other, warring with each other. And uh, and and so you know what what you know what 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 was Columbus wasn't wrong for for dealing with them, but then at the same time saying that it was not Columbus who uh, was responsible for the genocide, but the 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 prisoners who came with him, the vile men who came with him, who started killing and pillaging, and so it wasn't Columbus. So he restated all the ideas. Interestingly enough, you know, I thought to myself as I was sitting there that um, I think Chief Barat got a good, uh, you know, a good explanation. I could not have explained to him better why it was important all these years to have come on board with us in the Caribbean Freedom Project and called on the government to remove Columbus. You know, he was one of the people who had, um, you know, most vociferously took opposition to our position on the matter. But is he explicitly... Shabaka, is he explicitly in support of the campaign to remove Columbus now? Well, his his um, a representative of the First Peoples of Arima got up and said they the, the way they put it is that it is exactly the way he put it to us when we were meeting with him back in 2017, 2018, that uh, they have no problem with the removal. So it was kind of poetic justice in a kind of strange way that uh, a person describing themselves as Portuguese would get up and tell uh, the chief of the indigenous people that his people were warlike savages and that, um, and that uh, you know, and that it was just a few of them scattered across the Caribbean moving from here to there and so on. All the stuff that is part and parcel of the Columbus hero myth, all those horrendous uh, ideas, caribs, cannibals, all those ideas were in his discourse. So I thought that was, in a sense, a kind of uh, unfortunate, racist, but uh, in a sense, a kind of poetic, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the circle coming back around, in a sense, you know. Um, uh, so I think that, um, uh, but of course, there's no excuse in the level of, 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 of racism. And of course, uh, there was also a commentator, an African commentator, who was very much in support of, of, of keeping the monuments and so on, regurgitating another one of those kinds of uh, feel-good ideas that we would have uh, philosophical ways to approach the future that we would have gotten somewhere around independence, which states that, you know, for bad, for good, for worse, we're all here now, and so we should just embrace all of our history. Uh, yeah, but Shabaka, 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 besides the activist groups, including ourselves, which new voices did you hear, prominent new voices or otherwise, coming forward 
to support this the decolonization of public spaces? What are the new okay. voices you were hearing there today? One uh, one of the new voices was a Woodbrook Residence Committee. The Woodbrook Residence Committee came forward and said that it was time to remove uh, that memorial to the Boer War uh, generals, British Boer War generals. And they wanted them replaced with the people who had distinguished themselves from the community of, uh, of, of Woodbrook. So all those street names, Bullock, Kitchener, uh, etc., which are named after British Boer War generals and even a, I think a private is in there as well. Uh, they wanted those names uh, removed from the streets uh, and those streets now used to honor distinguished residents of Woodbrook. Uh, Brother Victor Rubadiri also made a good, a very interesting contribution stating that, um, you know, the colonial placed these people on the streets, on monuments and statues and so on in front of us because he said they were about the crimes that these people were committing. They, 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 they you know, they, they distinguished themselves uh, in ways that the colonials felt was appropriate, you know, so they were genos leaders in genocide and enslavement and, and so on. And he said that we now, he, he told the audience, we are now an independent people constructing a new civilization we're not about those things. So, of course, we can't continue to celebrate and glorify them. Uh, there were some other individuals. Um, the, the mayor of Port of Spain came forward early on to say that uh, whatever was discussed, he would be willing to, uh, to move on it in short measure. So he was committing his organization to, to move the process forward once the consensus had been arrived at. Uh, so it was, it was, it was, it was interesting. Um, that, uh, that brother Red Oak and, uh, yeah, Do Dr. Red Oak and, um, and, uh, brother, what's yeah, his but, name? Um, that's interesting because, uh, yeah, I was saying, Shabaka, that's interesting of the mayor because his, his predecessor would have removed himself from the responsibility, uh, to correct that problem with the Columbus statue. So that's important that this current mayor is saying that he would take that responsibility as the responsibility of the city mayor. Uh, Shabaka, as, as somebody living in the rural areas, we are hearing only the urban voices so far. Uh, were there people from outside of the city centers, from you know far-flung areas that came to the consultation and expressed any sentiments even about places close to where they may be residing? For example, you know, we have Picton Street in, all over the place and and some of these names that we are campaigning about also, you know, are replicated uh, in the countryside as well. Were there any voices that we can say were non-urban voices coming well, to the country? Uh, there was, a, there was a, a gentleman from, uh, as it might have been somewhere in the east, maybe Sandy Grandy, uh, who said that there was a Woodford Street in the east, in Arima. He was from Arima, and he said there was a Woodford Street in Arima. Uh, the, the uh, uh, what's his name, um, Eric Lewis, uh, came up from Maruga. And, of course, I think Eric might have been the most radical commentator today. Very interesting. <laughs> he called for the renaming of Port of Spain, the city itself. Columbus Channel. And the Columbus Channel out uh, in South Trinidad, to the Orinoco Channel. So I think, uh, you know, uh, Eric Lewis to Maruga might have made perhaps the most radical uh, suggestions to the committee today. Great, great. I think I'm hearing Victor's voice in the background there. <laughs> yes, uh, Brother Victor is with me, uh, assisting me uh, with the camera in the car. <laughs> okay, okay. Greetings, my brother. Greetings. And of I course, you know, we you. appreciate it. We appreciate your in input in this important venture, decolonizing of this country. Uh, we are uh, at the lot of work. I understand that when I can't check those things on my phone, I'm not on my PC this evening. So you would have to let us know what's going on with the studio. Right. So they've just gone to their um to their lotto break. 
And uh, we can, I think we can go ahead and start our segment with Dr. Ruda Arindal. I'm very excited to hear. Um, well, let's give Shabata an opportunity to wrap up what he's saying there. And then, of course, the lot of break might be over. So people will hear the beginning of Dr. Arindal's contribution. And then, yeah, Shabata, could you just wrap up the talk there with us? And, and uh, we are going to go on to our interview. All right. Well, I, I, what I just want to say then is, um, you know, in terms of those who came to the program today to hear what's happening in Venezuela, let me just say that um, I think that uh, progressive forces around the world are now waiting on the government of Venezuela to publish uh, a more detailed summary of the results, which would then end all the speculation. Uh, I would be having, this goes beyond speculation, which would dampen the kind of the, 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 the attempt at regime change that is taking place in that country. So uh, the Supreme Court has, 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 has made its statement. Uh, the electoral authority has, has declared uh, the uh, President Maduro, the winner of the Supreme Court, has said that, that, that has upheld that, that ruling. And now I think the onus would be on the government to publish the detailed findings and that i think it wouldn't put an end to the attempts at regime change but it would certainly dampen the enthusiasm for a uh for, for regime change uh in the international community okay so thank you shabaka and we can continue that conversation next week when hopefully you are in studio uh, i mean when you are perhaps better positioned to uh, to uh, take in the program. Uh, uh, where you are now is not the best for... Yes, for I'm, I'm going to sign out, uh, brother and sister, and we're listening on, on the radio. Okay, would you be coming back in? If, I, coming can, back if, in? I, get, if I get to a space where I can come back in on time properly. Okay, great, great. Yeah, but okay. I'm looking so, forward to hearing our, our dear friend. Yes, great, okay. So with that in okay. mind, I believe that we might be back live on Talk City 91.1 FM, I'm presuming so. So I want to especially welcome our guest for this evening's program, Dr. Ruda Arendel. Dr. Arendel, welcome to Indabo. Good evening. Let's welcome. welcome. Good evening. Dr. Thank you. Yes, good evening yeah. to you and your team um, and your audience. Thank you for this opportunity to be with you. And I, I'm listening here and enjoying every minute so far. Thank you. Right. We are honored to have you on the program. Dr. Arendelle is a human rights activist, an author, and a lecturer. She is the president of One St. Martin. St. Martin is, of course, in the Caribbean, for those of you who might be a little bit hazy with your geography. Uh, she is the president of One St. Martin and the current president of the Caribbean Studies Association, which is an academic association. From 2010 to 2012, she served as St. Martin's first Minister of Education, Culture, Sports and Youth Affairs in the UPDP coalition government. And she currently teaches at Howard University in the United States. Uh, right, so that is a brief bio, of course, I know Dr. Arendelle's bio can go on much longer than that. Of course, she has published quite a lot and all of that. So uh, you do have a picture. She is an activist. She's very much involved in reparations movement. And the topic we are going to be discussing, as I said earlier, it is about decolonization in the Dutch territories. Yeah. And uh, we are going to make the, the link with reparations and uh, see how that fits into the broader issue of reparations. And of course, the reparations uh, movement is very much alive and, and getting stronger every day. So uh, could we begin, Dr. Arundel, by explaining the status, the constitutional status of these territories? Should we call them colonies? Should we call them something as what are they and how did they get to be what they are now? Oh, that's, that for our listeners? that's a beautiful question because um, we've just had election about a week ago and I'll explain to you 
why the terminology sounds confusing, but it's really not. We are a colony by every definition of the word, but we are referred to constitutionally, first of all, in the within the kingdom. They they often refer to, to these islands, Aruba, Curacao, and St. Martin as um, autonomous countries within the kingdom. And at the same time, politically speaking, we've had scholars define it as what do they call it? Constituent states within the kingdom. They're all fancy terminology to say pretty much we are a colony. We are colonized by the Netherlands. And in the case of St. Martin, it is the Netherlands and France. So you have two parts of the island that are colonized by two European forces. And wh why do I say, say this? Um, we've just had a an election on Monday where the you are being asked to elect people to parliament. But in our system, our parliament is not really the highest body. It is a parliament, yes. And then the governing coalition would have to nominate the candidate ministers. They're not even called ministers. They're called candidate ministers. Because Just to happens, interject a little so that we can follow you more clearly. Is it the Parliament of St. Martin or the Parliament of the Netherlands? It's the Parliament of St. Martin, right? But, and it's a, it, and, it, and oftentimes you would think that the Parliament is the highest body, right? The people have chosen, this is their will, etc. But even after our Parliament has been selected, so there are 15 candidates for 15 seats, and whoever forms the majority government, they get to nominate the ministers but they will never become ministers unless they are screened. And that screening is done by the prosecutor's office, controlled by the Netherlands, um, the, the secret service, controlled by the Netherlands, and then the governor has to sign off. And when the governor signs the decree, then can that person be officially nominated a minister? So to say it's not a colony, it's a little stretch because every way it behaves everything like a colony. Um, even when the budget, the, the national budget is approved by parliament, it cannot be passed unless the there's a committee for financial supervision, which was put in place by the by the Netherlands and the island supposedly agreed to when they attained this new status in 2010 and that same government that you mentioned that I was part of. So there's this thing called the Committee for Financial Supervision, which also must approve your budget in order for it to be passed. So to say it's not a colony is a far stretch. It, it can be called whatever name it is, but it is a colony. Great, okay. Now let me ask you this question. Colonization breeds um, nationalist movements. Naturally, they go hand in hand. So what is the nature of the nationalist movement in St. Martin? And is there any collaboration or cooperation, if one exists, with the nationalists of the French sector of St. Martin? And also, what is the link or connection with the nationalists of the southern Dutch colonies, Curacao, Bonaire, Aruba, and so on. What is this, this, the nature of the nationalist movement now? How strong is it? And what is the degree of collaboration that you have? No, that's a very, a, another very interesting question because um, um, when we think of nationalism on the level of, let's say, European sense of nationalism, when we think of it on St. Martin, for example, let's take the French part. Um, political parties claim they are aligned with the parties in, the, in, in, in France. But in reality, it's like every party locally, it's very personal. Very, it's a, it's a small culture where everyone knows everyone. So there may be affiliations to bodies outside. But in reality, in St. Martin... Um, those are superficial because what is what is more important is the sense of Caribbeanness, is the sense of oneness, and this is the reason why we 
we founded the One St. Martin Association because um, that would be more nationalistic if there's such a thing. And, and, and in terms of saying in St. Martin, the people are historically one people. That is the nation. Um, so whether they are French or Dutch, they're historically culturally one people with two different and sometimes um, multi um, nationalities, right? So some St. Martiners may have both French and Dutch nationalities. Some have one, some have three American or other nationalities. But in reality, the, the indigenous or the traditional St. Martiner, as we would refer to ourselves, they're one people. So in my particular family, for example, I have nieces and nephews that have French nationality, nieces and nephews that have, they all live in the same home. You can be a French national and go to school on the Dutch side and, and you can work on the French side and live on the Dutch side and vice versa, et cetera. So those things are there at the administrative level, but if there's anything to be called nationalism, it would be more at the level of the St. Martin identity in terms of we are one people historically, culturally, we are one people. And so there is affiliation to Curacao. I, I was born in Curacao, for example. And so there, we, you have family in those other islands as well. But the affinity to Curacao, for example, traditionally and culturally, in St. Martin, you would find quicker a cultural affinity to Anguilla, for example, or St. Kitts and Nevis because of our history, right? Even though we are bound together in this Dutch kingdom and would have developed over, over time a relationship. So it's, it's very fluid. It, there are no borders that you mark and say, this is where it goes. It's very fluid. Um, and and, and it's, it, it's, it's the makeup of the St. Martin cultural fabric. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I get the sense that there is a nationalist movement. What is driving the nationalism if there is not a nationalist movement? I'm not sure I get that. Could, could you clarify that? I, I hear people use the term here and, and I tend to say, you know, you the rigid definition that you hear outside don't always apply to us, right? They hardly ever do. So people pick up the terminology. But when we speak in St. Martin of the nation, it is that 37 square mile of rock, right? That's the nation. Everything else is secondary. But now, you know, in the last 10, 20 years, you'd see a, a bigger drive to, to enforce Frenchness and Dutchness, you know, where, where the seat of power used to be Willem Stott in Curacao for the Netherlands Antilles, and Bastier and Guadeloupe for the French territories. Since their new status in 2007, the French part, and our new status in 2010, you would think we would become more progressively self-serving, self-sufficient towards independence. But what you're seeing is a, a bigger push from the metropole to, to have more control on the rock. And so there's often friction with groups like our organization, One St. Martin, and, and in terms of the direction that we think that the island ought to be heading. Um, okay, I want to bring in my, my colleague here, but I want to, I think it's, it's, it's obligatory on my part to ask you about reparations and how, you know, the reparations movement conjoin with the decolonization movement. Could you talk to that a little bit and then um, uh, Rene would, would um, take the, the, the questions after that. Yes, sir. Um, so One St. Martin, our organization, we became a member, an associate member of CARICOM Reparations Commission. We had petitioned for years to become a member because at the government level, our, our government was not doing this. The colony does not want to engage in a discussion on, on reparations. And so we had to seek membership through our NGO status. And in that conversation, now fast forward, there was the Dutch apology last year, um, actually the year before when the prime minister of the kingdom of the Netherlands apologized because he was forced to. And then the Dutch king also apologized on July 1st, 
2023, saying that there would be no, no discussion of reparations. They would apologize. And the idea is that they would put some money available for commemoration and projects and, and you could apply and get funding for a few thousand euros to do your projects, but that there would be no discussion of reparations. And we had said to our, our premier, referred here to as the prime minister, um, to not accept that apology on our behalf as descendants of enslaved Africans, to say to the Dutch prime minister and to the Dutch king, um, we're not accepting an apology that makes no commitment to reparations. Mm -hmm. And so there has been no official acceptance or rejection of the apology. But we are working with the CRC, with CARICOM, in terms of trying to get an official CARICOM response to the Dutch apology. And so we were consulted for our position on, on the issue. We stated very clearly that we didn't think the apology was a full apology. It was a formal apology, but it was not a full apology as CARICOM requires because there was no no discussion of reparations or commitment to non-repetition because of what we see happening on the ground where we live in this colony. While we are apologizing, we are bringing in more colonial structures, stronger colonial you know, um, control of our borders, of, of, of our way of life. Everything is becoming even more colonized as opposed to more freedom and self-governance. Self Okay, so Rene, um, you can pose your questions now. Okay, thank you, Dr. Fugas. I was actually going to ask um, Dr. Rendell about the reparations um, movement and specifically about the Dutch um, apology um, mm -hmm. that has been deemed inadequate. Um, has one seen Martin uh, in particular, Has have you all... Um, use that apology as a way to levy or, or um, justify and, and just support your demand for independence? Well, yes, that's exactly, well, even beyond that, what we did, we, we, we issued an official rejection of the apology. So mm -hmm. immediately thereafter, we said, we are not accepting it. It, it. You know, it's dishonorable to our ancestors. That was the first step. And then mm -hmm. what we what we also, so we demanded, first we had demanded that the king apologize because they were saying that the king would not apologize, but he did. And then we said that if there is no discussion of reparations, um, how about we ask, because we've been calling for a referendum for independence for a while now. And we are, we have always stated that reparations forms part of our independence package, right? You know, yeah. yes, and that's part of our discussion. Mm -hmm. We have asked for, we have issued what we believe is a claim, mm -hmm. an official claim where we think using the CARICOM 10 point action plan, mm -hmm. we've created our own 15 point plan that we believe should form part of our reparations conversation, our goodbye package as we move towards independence. Mm -hmm. um, we're not taken seriously, obviously, by by the Dutch state, but we're we're working with CARICOM and we're doing our work and we're hoping now that there's been a new election, it will probably not happen in the next four years because every time we look at the the the, the parties that make up the governing coalition and there has been no move by any of the parties in the past ten years, twelve years, to honor mm -hmm. a request for a rep, for a referendum, and so we're mm -hmm. pushing. We don't think the parliament will come out and declare independence, which they have the right to do. So they're not doing that. And so we are pushing for a referendum. And and what is the general sentiment of the public? Because I know you said that um, of recent years, there's this kind of push from the, 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 the Dutch kingdom or the Netherlands kingdom of, you know, um, Dutch, um, you know, and, and are reaffirming their culture and their identity. But what is the general sentiment of um, people from St. Martin about seeking independence or do, do they prefer to be a colony because of the perceived benefits of still being aligned to the, the Dutch 
That's a, we've had in the days of the Netherlands and at least two referendum, right? One was mm -hmm. in 1994 and then the other mm -hmm. one was in, in 2000. So our last referendum was 24 years ago. What the politicians often use is mm -hmm. to say the people chose the current status and they do not want independence. But that was 24 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. they, they, they use this, this, this statement that the people don't want it, but we don't know because we've not mm -hmm. consulted the people to say that the people don't or do not want, there are, there are quite a number of people that have been, you know, pro independence to what extent we don't know because the, the very, there's a very vocal minority that tries to speak on behalf of the majority and mm -hmm. what we're is then if you are if you are certain that the people do not want independence just table the referendum and you'll know for certain if that is the case right mm -hmm. that is still the case mm -hmm. right. right that's our argument and we're, we're sticking to that because if you within six years time could have two referendum on separate on a separate status for this island apart from the Netherlands and Antilles why mm -hmm. after the Four years can't we have a referendum on, on independence and and for us that's the logical route now like mm -hmm. i said the parliament can with the majority also declare that saint martin wishes to become independent but i don't see any of the the politicians oh, doing that. Yes. No. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Hi, Dr. Yeah. Yes, so I, I want to take the discussion a little bit more on a sort of a personal level. Um, Dr. Arundel, you were Minister of Education uh, in, uh, under the UPDP. We know the importance of education in the colonization of our people, the colonization of the mind the use of language, but particularly the content of the education system. We heard from Shabaka earlier how some apparently very educated people are still so much in love with the colonial value system. Mm -hmm. So as education minister, um, um, were you in any way you know, driven to do something to your portfolio to ensure that the schools teach a more decolonized uh, education content, or move in that direction, would there any? Uh, would, did you attempt it first, or um, did you want to attempt something like that and got pushed back? What what impact did you have as a minister on the decolonization process through education, and perhaps the other? Affiliated portfolios linked to that, if any at all. Could you speak to that? <laughs> ah, who? First, let me say that that government lasted eighteen months because we were wow. we were we were toppled for some of the policies, precisely of what you're referring to. But here's the the, the even sweeter part, I should say. Um, so in the election last Monday, I participated with a brand new party, which is a a, a more um, pro-independence leaning party that was just created about six, seven weeks ago. And we managed to capture a seat of the 15 seats. And we had campaigned on the education portfolio, right? We had campaigned on electoral reform and, and education as very strong suits. And we were pursuing that ministry. We were pursuing that ministry. And we were invited to form the government. We only got one seat in the in the in the election, but we were invited to form part of the government. And we requested the Ministry of Education for the same reason as you're as you're outlining there. And it was not granted. We were the minority in the so we will be part of the governing or we are invited to be part of the governing coalition, but we do not get to to, to manage the education ministry or portfolio. And, 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 and from my perspective, it is precisely because of that sense of fear, number one, that we are a little too radical or a little too anti-colonial 
and we had campaign on some. So it's it's to be seen what is going to happen in St. Martin in the, in, the, in the coming days, because the government has not yet formed. And then in the next four years, what happens with that portfolio, right? How does that translate? What we do know after I'd left office and why I said the Dutch is more um, adamant about, about the Re, they, they say recolonization, but I don't say recolonization because they've not really left. It's a, it's a, it's an ongoing colonization period. And so there's this thing. There was a, there was a report in terms of the evaluation of the education system done by, or at least spearheaded by the Dutch government, and it does conclude, like we do, that the education system is in shambles. But the solution that they are proposing is totally the opposite to what I would propose, what we would propose, because it's more colonial. It's more bring more Dutch language in, bring more Dutch structures in because and bring the education system, in particular, our University of St. Martin, to be now aligned with and under the umbrella of the Ministry of Education in the, in the Netherlands. Away from where we had been going with partnerships in the region, University of the West Indies, University of the Virgin Islands, et cetera. There's now um, signed agreements with the previous government that the government of St. Martin is going to pursue this direction for education reform, and it is aligning a lot more with the Netherlands. So okay, it's great. Yes, great. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Can conclude. No, I'm saying it's to be seen what happens in the next few years with education. Yes. So just um, because I'm a historian, and of course you also are in the history from this Caribbean Studies Association, you must be doing a lot of history as well. What kind of history is taught in the school system? Is it um, geared to understanding the history of the Caribbean or more the history of the Netherlands and the Netherlands in the Caribbean? What is it like? Um. All of the above. We have in our one, in the 16 square miles of Dutch territory, we have an American system of education, Canadian system of education, Caribbean system of, so we do have CXC schools here, um, European system of education. And in the CXC schools, these are schools that we've had to fought to have English as language of instruction in our schools over the years. And these are following the CXC Caribbean Examination Council, their curriculum. And in there, there's the Caribbean history, right? There is part of that there. Um, in the schools that are using Dutch as language of instruction, it's very little. When I was in school, it was like a page and a half, if you were lucky in the history book and it covered the entire Netherlands Antilles and so much Caribbean. It is very little and there's no effort to change that. You may find things like what is the capital of these islands and what is their 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 production, their economy, etc. That's about it. But the real Caribbean history we, we would not have gotten, I did not get at school, but I would learn that when I would go to the US. And now in the Caribbean Council, the schools that are taking the Caribbean Council examinations, they are getting a bit more of that. But um, it's also very limited. It's yeah, also okay. Very limited. So we are at the top of the hour, and 91.1 .1 FM would be leaving us in a couple of seconds. So we want to thank the listeners on 91.1 .1 for being with us this evening, and we hope to uh, see you again next next week at our next edition of Endavo. Um, Dr. Aridel, could you um, just um, give us your last word for this evening and let us know while you're doing that, what's next on the agenda of the decolonization process or what is the hope for going forward with decolonization as we wrap up? As we wrap up, I wanna thank you and your team again for this opportunity to share our work with the, your wider audience. Um, for us, we have, we're have we not giving up the fight for decolonization. We we have, similar to your program here, we have a, a weekly radio program, the Wanna Sex M, where we try to share with our audience, the Caribbean, what's happening in the Caribbean, what's happening around the world with regards to 
decolonization and independence, independence movement. Um, what we are also doing, like I said, we're working with CARICOM, with the CRC, and we have recently reached out, have been invited by the, the Baku Initiative Group, which is working on decolonization around the world. And we've been to two of their sessions and we're going to be collaborating with them for further support in our decolonization effort. Um, for us in one St. Martin, the job doesn't finish until number one, we're, we're independent sovereign state, but also until we become fully integrated within the CARICOM family. We believe that we belong in the CARICOM family as a fully integrated member. And because we believe we have a lot to contribute to regional development, and we wanna be at that table in a, in a meaningful way, in a more meaningful way. So that's our aim as 1SXM, 1 St. One Martin. Thank you very much for being with us this evening. And surely we are going to invite you again sometime in the future. And we hope that you are with us again to continue the discussion on decolonization until independence, to the struggle continues. We yes. want to thank our listeners, our viewers online, live for joining us this evening. Thank you, Rene, for debuting uh, as a co-host this evening, our brother Shabaka uh, en route to all my guests. Thanks for joining us, taking some time to join us. And of course, uh, in studio, Nelly, I believe we have in studio. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you again next week on Indabo, the program where knowledge groups, Emancipation Support Committee of Trinidad and Tobago, give us a like, subscribe to this YouTube channel and Facebook, give us a like, subscribe. We need to grow the channel as well, and only you can do it. So thank you. Good evening, good night, good morning, wherever you are. See you next week. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone.